What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're going to be talking about esophagitis. Before we get started, please take a quick second, go down the description box below. We got a link to our website. I'm telling you, we got some great notes and illustrations, things that I think will be super critical to, for helping you guys understand this topic. Go check it out. Also, if you guys like this video, you benefit from it, it makes sense. Please support us by hitting that like button, commenting down in the comment section, and please subscribe. All right, also, Esophagitis, what is it? It's inflammation of the esophagus. We ain't noobs, we know this stuff, right? So there's something that's inflaming the esophagus. There could be a ton of reasons why, we'll discuss that in detail. But the basic concept is you're really, really inflaming the esophagus. Now when you inflame the esophagus, what are the common clinical features that patients with esophagitis will present with? The most common presentation of really just jacking this area up is it can lead to what's called dysphagia. So this is kind of difficulty with swallowing. It can lead to very significant pain with swallowing. This is probably one of the big common features. It's called odynophagia. Odynophagia, this is painful swallowing. And the last one, which is actually pretty common as well, is because your esophagus is inflamed, it's gonna burn, it's gonna hurt. And the pain areas it typically tend to be in the chest, so we call this retrosternal chest pain, it's like heartburn, or it's near the epigastrium, and this can be dyspepsia. So watch out for things like heartburn, kind of that sensation, if you will, or dyspepsia. These are pretty common symptoms associated with this. All right. Now, the next thing I want you guys to think about is what are the complications associated with esophagitis? So if you tear up the esophagus, you inflame that thing up, what are the problems with that? Well, with chronic, chronic, chronic inflammation and significant inflammation, that tissue is gonna have to heal, it'll undergo fibrosis, and then eventually, you'll narrow this dang esophageal lumen and lead to strictures. So that's another potential complication is strictures. The next thing that I also want you guys to be wary of in patients who have esophagitis, this is probably the most scary complication associated with esophagitis, and especially with a very particular type, we'll talk about it later, called caustic-induced esophagitis, is it's literally the agents are so strong it can rip a hole through the esophagus. And this is called esophageal perforation. So esophageal perforation is a really, really scary complication. Now, with that being said, what are the scary, scary features associated with an esophageal perforation? If you perf this sucker, you can cause air to enter into the mediastinum. You can cause inf like a lot of different agents to move into the mediastinum. This can literally lead to a patient becoming septic. So you really want to watch out for any kind of scary risk of infections, but most concerning is a septic patient. This patient can have an increased white blood cell count, fever, hypotension, it's terrifying, so watch out for that. The last thing is if you are ulcerating and eroding and tearing through the esophageal mucosa, guess what's just beneath in the submucosa? Blood vessels. If you rip into them, blood starts leaking into the esophageal lumen, you're gonna poop out black and you're gonna freak out. So watch out for GI bleeding as well. So again, the complications associated with esophagitis include strictures, esophageal perforation, which can increase the risk of infections and sepsis, or you can also have a GI bleed. Now let's talk about what are the causes of the esophageal inflammation. All right, so esophagitis, we got an inflamed esophagus. Again, the patient will present with odynophagia, dysphagia, retrosternal chest pain, dyspepsia. The scary complications include strictures, a perforation, and as well as watch out for GI bleeding. Now, what are the reasons that esophagus is all jacked up and inflamed? Well, you pay the price when you have esophagitis. All right, I know it's corny, but that's the mnemonic, price. So what does this include? This is pill-induced esophagitis is the first one. Okay, so pill-induced esophagitis. The next one is reflux esophagitis. So again, reflux esophagitis. The next one is infectious esophagitis. Again, infectious esophagitis. The next one here is gonna be a nasty, scary one called caustic esophagitis. Again, caustic esophagitis. And the last one here is gonna be eosinophilic esophagitis. 
Okay, my friends, so again, eosinophilic esophagitis. So with all of that being said, what do we got? We got price, pill-induced esophagitis, reflux esophagitis, infectious esophagitis, caustic esophagitis, and eosinophilic esophagitis. All right, for pill-induced, you gotta ask yourself the question, what's the pills that you're taking, bro, that's causing all these problems? Well, the pills that are usually the issue here, there's a couple of them. So what you wanna look for in the history is things like NSAIDs, doxycycline, potassium chloride, and bisphosphonates. These are usually the triggers. Okay, so again, NSAIDs, potassium chloride, doxycycline, bisphosphonates. The chemical comp capacity of these drugs have the ability, if again, if not taken with enough water, if they get stuck there, they have the ability to injure the mucosa and cause massive inflammation. The next one is reflux esophagitis. It doesn't take a genius to figure out what are the particular uh, history features that you want to be able to pick up for this patient. This is a patient who has gastroesophageal reflux disease. So it's usually the patient with GERD who's kind of like having a lot of problems with PPIs. They're not really kind of responding appropriately to this. So it's usually refractory GERD. That hydrochloric acid is tearing up the esophagus. We talked about that in the GERD lecture. The next one is an infectious esophagitis. Here's the thing, with this one, you have to look in the clinical vignette for the patient to be immunocompromised. And usually the easiest way for that to be presented is a patient with HIV, who then, because they're immunocompromised, they're more susceptible to infections that normal people would not get, CMV, HSV, and Candida. Okay, so again, if a patient has infectious esophagitis, they are usually immunocompromised, usually HIV positive, which increases them getting the risk of CMV esophagitis, HSV esophagitis, and Candida esophagitis. Okay, we come down to the next one here, caustic esophagitis. This one absolutely terrifies me. If I ever see a patient with this one, it's you're gonna wanna run because these patients can get super, super sick on you. This is the ones that can literally perf their esophagus. Usually the cause is, it's usually an event of kind of a suicide attempt, unfortunately, where they drink something like a strong acid or a strong base, and they just cause massive necrosis and eschars of the esophagus. So you wanna watch out for things like strong acids and strong base, but here's the thing, they're usually drinking it. And so if you drink something like that, it's gonna burn up the oral cavity, it's gonna burn up the pharynx, it's gonna burn up the larynx, and it may even get into their airway a little bit too. So they'll have features of esophagitis and upper airway problems. So watch out for strong acid, strong bases, things like oral burns, things like drooling, and things like strider. Okay, again, caustic esophagitis, strong acid, strong base, really tearing up the esophagus, but also will tear up the oral cavity, tear up the pharynx, and tear up the actual upper airway as well in the process. That's a scary one. And again, high risk of perforation. The last one is eosinophilic esophagitis. Eosinophils are infiltrating the esophagus and causing massive amounts of inflammation. What's the trigger? Look for a patient with the atopic triad. I know you know this. It's the patient who has asthma, allergies, and some type of atopic dermatitis. And usually, they eat a particular food, so they have a natural allergy to it, and it triggers an eosinophilic infiltration of the esophagus and inflames that puppy up. So in the vignette, look for atopic triad, and a f the, because of that, they have a food allergy that inflames up the esophagus. So again, this is the big thing to remember for eosinophilic esophagitis. Patient has the atopic triad features, asthma, allergies, dermatitis. They ingest a food allergen, boom, eosinophils infiltrate the esophagus and cause massive inflammation. These are the causes of esophagitis. Now what we have to do is take the patient who comes in with odynophagia, dysphagia, retrosternal chest pain complications and diagnose the esophagitis and the cause of it. Let's get to that. We now move into this next component here, which is diagnostic approach to esophagitis. You're at this point saying, okay, there's a lot of different types of esophagitis. I don't really know how I'm supposed to figure them all out. I do understand a little bit more of the complications in their classic presentation. How do I go about determining which is the type of esophagitis? 
Well, the first thing I think that's really important is you have to first say, do they have any features of complication such as an esophageal perforation? Because this has a very high mortality rate if not caught. If they do, the gold standard test is a contrast esophagram. The reason why is, is if I do this contrast, usually with a gastrographin, they uh, kind of ingest this gastrographin, it moves down into the esophagus, and you'll see the contrast leaking here right into the mediastinum. And that's definitely going to show you, okay, they definitely have an esophageal perforation. I have, my treatment's going to differ a lot with that. Another test that may also add to that utility here is that if you get a chest x-ray, you see this here, this is evidence of subcutaneous emphysema that maybe if you don't feel it very well on the, the actual exam, you'll see it on the chest x-ray. And then if you look here, oh man, I see air in the mediastinum and that's called a pneumomediastinum. And so this would help you to at least say, Okay, I have features like chest pain, subcutaneous emphysema, ham and sign, maybe some features of sepsis. I have a pneumomediastinum on my chest x-ray. I should definitely get a contrast esophagram. All right, that's how we would find that. And usually that's with caustic esophagitis. If they don't, okay, well, that's good. Then from this point, I can do an EGD. The reason why is EGDs really shouldn't be performed if you think that they have an esophageal perforation because it can worsen that perforation. So we want to try to avoid that. So with an EGD, it's a beautiful test. You take and you run a scope down through the esophagus and you can visualize the entire esophagus. So I'll be able to see, oh my gosh, there's the pill fragments from the NSAIDs or the bisphosphonates or the doxycycline adherent to the wall. And I see ulcers, that's probably pill induced, especially if the history suggests that they're taking those. They have a history of GERD, so chronic reflux, and they have erosions, which we can base on a lot of different scoring systems. There's a lot of them. We're not going to talk about them, but usually in the appropriate clinical context, reflux esophagitis would help to nail that, that diagnosis. The other one is, are they immunocompromised? If they are, this really makes me think it's infectious. So then I got to really dig a little bit deeper and take a look at these ulcers. If they are big, gargantuous, gaping ulcers like this, I'm really scared for CMV. I should biopsy this area. And when I do that, what happens is you see cytomegaly. That's usually the key. So cytomegaly with inclusion bodies. And that's going to help me think that this is likely CMV esophagitis. It's always important with any kind of like really bad infection, you should always send off cultures of the biopsy to make sure that the actual virus is susceptible to particular antivirals. So always get viral cultures to make sure that you're putting them on the appropriate antiviral. The next thing is do they have white plaques? On top of that, when you biopsy it and you see this cottage cheese look and I biopsy and I see hyphae, that's definitely like candida. And if they have thrush, that even helps out with that diagnosis. The last one is if they have like these small round herpetic vesicles and then even maybe they have it in the oral mucosa, definitely seems like herpes. Get the actual biopsy and look for giant cells with Cowdery A inclusion bodies. And that really, really help you to say that it's likely HSV. Now, same thing, HSV, and CMV can have certain types of resistance. So make sure you send off viral cultures to make sure that they're susceptible to their appropriate antivirals, such as acyclovir or gancyclovir, which we'll talk about in the treatment section. The next one is you really want to be careful. Again, if I have any degree of concern that these patients may have something such as, um, you know, caustic esophagitis, and I think that they may have perforation, I should really be careful. But if I do go down, I do an EGD, and I see like this dead necrotic type of tissue that looks like really, really nasty called eschars. I may start thinking about potentially, you know, a uh, type of caustic esophagitis. I also want to be careful. Do I notice a perforation? Oh, that's not good. Okay, this definitely could be due to caustic esophagitis. And also fistulas are pretty common with caustic esophagitis. But oftentimes, again, caustic esophagitis should not be diagnosed via an EGD. It really should be diagnosed via contrast esophagram or sometimes even a, a contrasted CT study. Again, with this one being the case, I really would try to avoid doing an EGD if you have a strong degree of suspicion for caustic esophagitis. The last one's actually really interesting, and this is called esoph eosinophilic esophagitis. If I see like these like fragile types of like rings in the esophagus, I'm definitely thinking that it could be eosinophilic esophagitis. And if I biopsy it, and I get tons of intraepithelial uh, eosinophils from that biopsy, really makes me think that it's eosinophilic esophagitis. So that's how we would go about diagnosing these. And I know that's a lot, right? But the treatment is actually very simple if we know the cause. So if it's pill-induced, 
just discontinue the medication if possible. Or just ensure that when you take the medication, you take it with a full glass of water and you stay upright for at least 30 minutes after taking that pill. With reflux, it's treating the GERD. So it's about putting them on a proton pump inhibitor, an H2RA of some sort, but also treat their underlying trigger. Maybe it's weight loss, maybe it's avoiding particular foods. With infectious esophagitis, it's about eradicating the infection. So with candida, we treat them with fluconazole. With HSV, if they're potentially sensitive to it, we treat them with acyclovir. If they're resistant, we may go up to like gancyclovir. For CMV, it's gancyclovir, but if they're resistant, we may go to something called foscarnate. The next one's caustic esophagitis. For caustic esophagitis, it's actually important to really treat them more supportive. And so you're really going to be doing a lot of other things that we could talk about later when we get into perforations, uh, particularly gastrointestinal perforation. But for now, it's more about avoiding further injury. So how do we do that? Do not try to avoid, don't induce emesis or vomiting in these patients. Don't try to neutralize the acid or base. If you try to push them to vomit up the bleach or the detergent, whatever they ingested, that acid that's coming up from their stomach will just worsen their injury and potentially cause a perforation if it hasn't already. So really avoid that. Eosinophilic esophagitis, it's about avoiding the trigger, which is food allergens. But sometimes that's not enough and you gotta kinda shut down those eosinophils. And ways that we'll do that is what's called fluticasone propionate. It's a steroid. And it's not oral, it's actually an inhaled form. It's like a spray that we usually use for patients who have like uh, 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 allergic, uh, sinusitis or allergic rhinitis. And usually you'll spray it up your nose. And these patients, you'll spray it directly into their mouth, they'll ingest it. And what happens is that fluticasone propionate will try to shut down these eosinophils and prevent them from infiltrating into the actual esophagus and promoting inflammation, which is pretty helpful. With any type of esophagitis, it's important to remember that the esophagus is injured, it's inflamed, and you don't want to inflame it anymore. And so by preventing further eosinophilic, I'm preventing further uh, esophagitis, what should I do? For all of these patients, at least for a limited time, maybe eight weeks, you should put them on a proton pump inhibitor. What happens with this is it's really just going to kind of tell the stomach to stop producing hydrochloric acid to it some degree. Now, why is that important? Well, PPIs directly block this hydrogen proton ATPase pump, so they reduce hydrochloric acid secretion. Well, the concept here is that now the stomach is not producing hydrochloric acid as heavily, it's not going to cause some of this to reflux into the esophagus and injure the esophagus even more. So I'll reduce esophagitis on top of their already present esophagitis, which will be very helpful for them and prevent complications such as bleeding, such as strictures, or such as perforation. All right, my friends, that covers esophagitis. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. And as always, until next time. Thank you.